Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, the scripture text is taken from Luke chapter 12, the gospel of Luke chapter 12, and I'm going to start reading at verse 13. And the hymn that's being spoken of here is Jesus, and this is what it says. It says, and someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has a, an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Pray with me. Lord, we want to be rich toward you. And worship is a, is a part of, of sharing in your abundance, sharing in your grace. Opening scripture, it's a part of sharing in, in your abundance, sharing in your grace. Lord, breathe on us this day that we might be rich toward you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The writer of Luke, he, Luke he, he describes the scene that's going on here at the beginning of chapter 12. He said there were so many thousands in the multitudes, they were stepping on each other. Well, that's not at all what you want, people stepping on each other. They, it must have been a time that made folks a little bit irritable. I mean, that's what happens when you step on people is they get irritable. But then a heckler broke out of the crowd, and he shouted to Jesus, teacher, Tell my brother to share in the inheritance, the, in the family inheritance. I, well, I want to let you know that a heckler in the middle of a sermon isn't what any preacher wants. And, and Jesus calls back out to him. He says, man, who appointed me judge or arbitrator over you? Well, that, isn't that what we all want anyway? Don't we want a righteous judge? Somebody tell them that they did wrong. Just split, you know, divide everybody up between sheep and goats and tell the goats that they're goats. You know, tell them that to do right. But that's not what Jesus does at all. Instead, what he does is he, he tells a story. And he tells a story about a, a, a certain rich man who, who had land that was very productive is what it says. It wasn't scrubby land. It wasn't land that he was lucky to get anything. He knew it was going to be productive. And this land was so productive that it, it was more productive than he ever imagined that it could be. That when, when someone builds a barn, they build a barn with imagination. Thinking, well, what will be the biggest crop that I have? That if you build the barns too small, it's, you end up having to throw away a lot of your crop. 
If you build the barn too big, you've used too many resources that you never get to use. Resources of, of space, resources of time, resources of, of, of whatever material you built the barn out of. Well, this fellow had a land that was very productive, and he built barns on it. But then he had a bumper crop. He had more, more produce than he ever thought that he would. So he said, hey, I'll tell you what, I'm going to tear down those barns and build bigger ones. And that night, he died. And God, God calls out to him, and that's, whenever God appears in a story, it's time to listen. And in Jesus' story, this is where God speaks out, and he says, you fool. Now, he doesn't call him evil. He doesn't call him bad. He says, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. Now, who will own what you have prepared? That's God's question. Who will own what you have prepared? In other words, you can't take it with you. So what do you do? And that's what I want to talk about this morning. You can't take it with you. So what do you do? And the first thing that I want to say this morning, you can't take it with you. So what do you do? Well, what you do is you live faithfully. So often we think about faith as having faith in ourselves, trusting in ourselves. I, I, we're Americans. We believe in that can-do spirit, and we, we just we, we jump behind, and we, we do, we do. Well, Jesus isn't talking about that. Sometimes we think about faith. That, well, it's not so much faith in ourselves. We have faith in um, a code or a standard that we follow. And as long as we follow the code and we follow the standard, that we're doing what, what we ought to be doing, then everything's going to be okay. Well, that's a little deeper than just living for ourselves, but that still is not what Jesus is talking about. Back in 1962, there was a 14-year-old boy named Robert White. He wrote to President John F. Kennedy's personal secretary and asked her for an autograph of the president. Well, she didn't send him an, a, a, a personal autograph of the president. What she sent was a facsimile, but that started the relationship between Robert White and, and Evelyn Lincoln, JFK's personal secretary. And she was so taken that this, this 14-year-old boy was interested in anything that the president had touched, any memorabilia, anything, that she would save little things for him. Sometimes they'd be throwaway documents, or sometimes they'd be doodles on a piece of paper during a meeting that the president had done. And when he died, Robert White had over 50,000 pieces of John F. Kennedy memorabilia. But it all started with a relationship a relationship and in, in, in correspondence. That that's that's what what Jesus requires of, of you and me, a relationship. The way that that Jesus put it in Revelation 3:20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. That it's a relationship where Yes, he's not going to knock down the door, but he's there. He's urging that it's a grace that's chasing us and that we have an opportunity to open the door and sit down to dine with him. That it's a relationship as a, as a friend. To live in faith is, is a disciplined dedication to paying attention to what he says, to listening to him as a friend, talking to him as a friend, to following him as Lord. That on the cross, Jesus gave his life for you and for me to wipe away all the sins, but he rose from the grave to give us power here in this life, power that we might live faithfully, not trusting in ourselves, not trusting in a standard, but trusting in Him, leaning on Him, paying attention to Him. And that's the relationship that He calls us into. That the way that Paul puts it in Philippians 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That He, 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 
he's not just writing off platitudes, sitting in a field somewhere. Here's another platitude for you. Paul is writing from prison when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That it's the risen Christ, the Spirit of of Jesus that lives on the inside of him so he can do all things with the strength that Jesus gives in that that faith relationship. And that's the relationship that he offers you and, and me. Well, we can't take it with us. So what do you do? You live faithfully. That there's a a legacy that we build rich toward God in walking with Him every day, in listening to Him every day. We're living in a time right now where about half the people are hopeful, hopeful for the future, hopeful for the next four years, and about half the people are hurting and confused. And they're staring into the unknown. If ever there's a time to live faithfully, it's in a time where you're either hopeful for the future or you don't know what that future brings. That we lean on Him, we rely on Him in a relationship where we walk with Him. The risen Christ. You can't take it with you, so what do you do? You live faithfully. But the second thing that I want to talk about this morning is you can't take it with you, so what do you do? You love boldly. You love boldly. Um, Don Locker tells a story about a woman in his congregation. She was in her late 80s, and she was moving from her home into a, a retirement center, an assisted living facility. And she had some friends that were living in that assisted living facility that she knew already, and they had prepared a banquet for her. They had balloons, they had, they had a cake, they had a time where other people that she didn't know would be there to greet her. And they put her right next to a, a handsome, well-dressed older gentleman, and when she sat down, she couldn't quit staring at the man. Well, the man got a little uneasy. Finally, she said, I'm sorry that I keep staring at you. You remind me so much of my second husband. He said, uh, oh, well, how many times have you been married? She said, once. Well, that's bold, isn't it? That's risky, isn't it? That's sticking your neck out. That's the kind of love that, that Jesus calls us to. Not a love that's safe. Not a love just of, of me and mine. Not even a love for, for our own standard or our own code. But a love for others. A love that sticks its neck out. A love that risks a love where we love boldly. A little while back, I told a, a story about a time where I saw a fellow sitting on a sidewalk, and I went over, I sat next to him, and I asked him if everything was okay. Well, one of the members r- shared a story with me shortly after that. He said, you know, after I heard that, that sermon, my wife and I were driving, and we saw this fellow sitting on a guardrail, and he, he didn't look like he was doing too well and we remembered the sermon so we turned around and we we went back and I asked him I said uh, uh, he said are are you okay and the fellow said no I'm not I had a heart attack and I've been out walking to get stronger and I'm afraid that I walk too far and I don't have enough energy to get back home this member of our church said so I asked him would you like a ride he said that fellow looked up at me and said you're one of God's angels well, I don't know that we're called to be God's angels, but I do know that we've, called, we've been called to be light in the darkness. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Well, it's not just because we live by a standard. It's not just because we pull ourselves up by the bootstrap. It's because we love boldly, that we reach out and let folks know that they matter to God and that they matter to us as well. It's the legacy that you and I leave in this world. And there's a world out there that needs to know that they matter to God. There's a world out there that needs to know, needs to hear, needs to see what Jesus in this world looks like, what he sounds like. And you are that light. You are that love. You can't take it with you, so what do you do? You love boldly. 
You can't take it with you, so what do you do? Well, you live faithfully. Third thing that I want to talk about this morning, you can't take it with you, so what do you do? You give generously. You give generously. When I was in the sixth grade, I wanted a dirt bike in the worst kind of way. I take that back. I didn't want a dirt bike. I wanted my dad to buy me a dirt bike in the worst sort of way. But I knew that there was just about zero chance of my father ever buying a motorcycle. Not for me or for anyone else. That he had let us know that he hated motorcycles. So I asked him. I said, you know, if I paid for it on my own, could I buy a dirt bike? Well, he knew pretty well my prospects of earning enough money to buy a dirt bike were about zero. So he said, sure. Well, I started looking for ways to earn money. There was a kid in the neighborhood who delivered the papers door to door, Atlanta Journal Constitution. And I asked him, I said, how long do you think you'll be the paper boy? He said, well, I've been thinking about giving it up. So I went to my father. I said, would it, would it be all right if I got a job as a paper boy? My father said, sure. So I went to the guy's boss and with him and we made a quick transition and I became paper boy, delivering the Atlanta Journal five days a week right after school and on Saturday and Sunday first thing in the morning. And it wasn't the kind of thing where I went out, I delivered the paper and they said, uh, well done, here's your, your salary and they mailed me a check. It didn't happen that way, not at all. The way that it happened was that I had to go door to door and I had to knock on the door and nag in order to collect for the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. <laughs> well, there was more than once that I knocked on the door. I saw people's light go out, heard the back door shut, car crank up. And they were running from the paper boy whenever. But I had, if I wanted to get paid at all, I had to knock on the door. And I had to collect for the, for the Journal and Constitution. Well, money started coming in. And dribs and draps, 335 at a time is what I collected for a month for the Atlanta Journal Constitution. But I started to earn a little money, and that's when my father taught me one of the most valuable lessons I, th I think that he taught. He said, You know, you're starting to get in a little money. You set aside a little to spend, a little for you to enjoy. You set aside a little to save, and you set aside some for God. He said, But if you start, setting aside just for you first. Uh, there will never be enough to save and there'll be an, never be enough for God. He said, if you start first with setting aside 10% for God, 10%, that's what the Bible says. If you start with 10% for God, there'll always be enough to save and enough for what you want. Well, it wasn't that hard. I mean, after all, Dad did give me a roof over the head. He, he did put food on the table. It wasn't that hard. It took a little longer to buy the dirt bike, and I had to work for a year to buy the dirt bike. But the real, the real test came when I got my first real job. I was pastor of a little church, and I got pa paid the, the grand sum of $7,000 a year. I qualified for food stamps and free cheese. <laughs> well, could I do it? Well, that's what I did. I set aside 10% first for God, and guess what? There was enough to save a little, and there was enough for me. But then the biggest test came when I, I got, after three years, I, I, I got a raise. I went to a little bigger church, and I got $12,000 a year. Well, then I started thinking of all the things that that I hadn't been able to buy, all the things that I wanted, all the things that I, that I thought that I needed, would I be able to set aside first 10% for God? Or would I only give God the leftovers? Well, that's, that's when I continued the practice, setting aside 10% for God. And you know what? There was enough to save, and there was enough for me. That... The temptation, the real temptation comes in abundance, not in scarcity. The temptation, the temptation for self and what we want and putting ourselves in the center of this universe, it doesn't come in scarcity. It comes in abundance. And you and I have been given us a, just a generous, gracious abundance from God. 
And if, and, and if we set aside and only give God the leftovers, well, we won't be rich toward God. We'll be holding what God desires to do in the world. We'll be, we'll be shortchanging God in what he, he decides to do in the world. Today is starting our 2021 pledge campaign. That um, just like you do in your home, set aside, make a budget for the coming year, that's what we've got to do in the church. And because you've been generous, there's some amazing things that we've been able to do here at Roswell United Methodist Church that we've been able to start this year, our neighbor's pantry. And here, during the pandemic, being able to, to reach out and feed those families that normally would be on the free lunch, whose children would be on the free lunch program, being able to, to reach out and, and help those that, that, that food is not a guarantee. And that every week, we feed over 200 families, 1,000 people a week, that we've been able to, to give fresh produce and, 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 and food so they can, and groceries so they can make their, their, their food, their menus themselves. Because you've been generous, we've been able to, to reach out to children and youth to let them know who they are in Jesus Christ, that they belong to Him, and that they matter to God, and that they, they matter to us. That we've been able to reach out, and, and this year, during the pandemic, we've been able to, to, to join up with our mission partner, Hilma Kantu. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to see those, those short faith and community videos that we've had each week during our, 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 our faith and community moment, our community and faith moments here in the service. If you have you can go on our website and see some of those. A couple of weeks ago, we had one with Hilma. And with Hilma, we're able to reach out to school children who are trying to learn to read, especially those who read with English as their second language. And, and online, we set up virtual tutors, volunteers from this church teaching children to read. Those with our pet ministry have found ways to reach out to those children and families as well with their pets. That we found creative ways to reach out, to let folks know that they, they matter to God and that they matter to us. Leftovers won't do that. Leftovers won't continue to reach out into the world that needs to know that they matter to God. That seven days a week, this church reaches out with 12-step groups. We have 25 12-step groups here. Leftovers won't do that. Worship. We've been able to reach out through worship online and to continue to do that, leftovers won't do that. We've discovered that we're even reaching, uh, not over this, only this country, but there's a small pocket of folks in Ireland that, that tune into our services each week. Leftovers won't do that. Our 2021 pledge campaign, I want to invite you to give and to give generously. That here in this place of community and faith, you can... You can make a pledge for the coming year of something more than, than leftovers. Something more than leftovers. Be in prayer. Invite God and, and to, to, to make His home in your heart and, and what He's calling you to do. You can also look at rumc.com slash pledge and go on and, and make your pledge there. That here... Here, our mission is to help people live a, a Christ-centered life through worship, through community, and through outreach. We know that we've, we've set aside the, this, this place of community and faith, and for such a long time we thought of it as being inside these doors. But here during the pandemic, it's become outside these doors as well. We have parents bringing their children, riding their bicycles in our parking lot, and I'm glad that we do. We have people walking our parking lot. We have our, 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 our prayer stations where they can go from one to the other and, and spend time in prayer. We have a green space 
where people meet often. We have pavilions where not only do Bible studies meet, people meet with instruments to play music, acoustic music. We need more of those. We need an upper lawn, a place where that can convert from a small group space where people come together here in the community to a large group space where people can meet outdoors. Leftovers won't do that. So I want to invite you, invite you to give and to give generously. That you can't take it with you, so give. Give generously. Take part in our 2021 pledge campaign. You can't take it with you, so love boldly. There's a world out there that needs to know that they matter to God and they matter to you as well. You can't take it with you, so live faithfully. Living faithfully doesn't mean that we have faith in our own abilities. It certainly doesn't mean that we just have a faith in, in our own standard, our own code. Faith is a relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. And it may be that you've never answered that knock. You've never opened the door, that you've never said yes for His Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, the risen Christ, to live in your life, and that you want to do that now. Well, I want to pray with you right now to do that. Let's pray. Jesus, this is your day, and it's your time. And here in this time, I, I think there are those that have, have felt your nudge, have felt your, your shake, your spirit knocking on the, the door of their hearts and giving them grace enough, strength enough to open the door, to dine with you, to talk, to listen as a friend, to walk, to follow you as Lord, to know that their lives don't focus around just their wants, to know that their lives... Well, that none of our lives focus around just a standard that we live by. That, Jesus, you are. You are the one that leads us. You are Lord. You are that friend. That, that we have a de de dedicated discipline to, to listen, and follow, to share. Lord, may that relationship start this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. May we be rich toward you. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life, and my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.